You might have seen me limping this morning. Uh, my right knee is kind of blown out. I think I told my wife last night, I'm not sure. That's when you know the end is near when you go down bowling with your kids. <laughs> You're not far off. We were a sad sight, man. I took my kids to celebrate graduating another school year at their school. So I took Malachi, Isaiah, and Jeremiah out to Piedmont Social House to go bowling because they had this deal that you got... Uh, food with your game, and uh, it was just an amazing time. And I looked at us as we walked in. We were high fiving, we were celebrating, we were excited. And when we left, Malachi was holding his hand because his fingers got jammed in the ball. Jeremiah was limping because his last bowl, he actually bowled off the back of his calf. And I fell and went down and busted my knee wide open. Um, so, anyway, uh, it, was a, it was a dreadful experience at the Piedmont Social House. We went in happy, but we came out sad. Uh, how many of you believe that church is the opposite? You should come in here sad, but go out happy. Because God gives you a fresh filling of his Holy Spirit. So my prayer as a pastor of this amazing congregation and this amazing community that God is doing amazing things in is that you would be encouraged. No matter what you've been through all week long, whether you have a limp, whether your financial situation says you've got no money, whether the doctor came in and said your platelets are off, whether you feel like you've been betrayed, you've been done wrong, whatever the case might be, your neighbor is not who you wanted him or her to be, you've got situations with family members, you've got old scars you're dealing with, you feel like there might be a new scar right around the corner, and there probably is if you live life in this world, we want to encourage you today. So step one, did the worship encourage you? Okay, now it's time to get into the Word of God. Go to Acts chapter 11 as we continue our series. Check out this video and then we'll...
see in the Bible. And I believe that we can still have that today. There are some pastors that actually preach that the same spirit that existed in the early church doesn't exist for the church today. And that's very sad to me. I believe God can still raise the dead. I believe that he can still heal cancer. I believe people can still get up and take their mat and walk. I believe marriages can still be healed. I believe hurting teenagers can still go off and and live a rebellious life, but yet come to a church and understand that God has an amazing plan for their life, an amazing future, and they can get caught up in the Spirit of God, and they can change their life with the world. I mean, I believe it. So here's what we're going to talk about today. In Acts chapter 11, we're going to read. We're following the life of Peter right now. Last week, we talked about how he had this amazing encounter with the Holy Spirit where he learned through a vision that God doesn't make anything that's unclean. He doesn't make anything common. When you are caught up in the power of God, you live an uncommon life. And Peter is on his way to go and defend this fact with the circumcised group that were Christians, but they were telling everybody, if you really want to be a Christian, you have to get circumcised. And I got to ask everybody here, who is showing up for that party? Not me. I'm going the way of the Gentiles. We're going to find Jesus through breaking bread and taking some communion and believing in Jesus. So Peter is about to defend his right in what happened at Cornelius' house. And this is what we read in Acts chapter 11, starting with verse 1, going to verse 18. Don't have a lot of time, and we want to save time and room for what God is doing in Pastor Tom's life and his family. They are going to help plant and start a new campus for Steel Creek. Isn't that exciting? That there are going to be people that are going to believe. There are going to be people that are going to be saved and baptized. A community is going to be transformed. So we want to save time for that because we have cake, we have ice cream. We want you to pray, talk to Pastor Tom, pray with him, and even talk about the possibility to go and join him and support him in that new endeavor. So let's get into the word and let's save time for that as well. Verse 1. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and you ate with them. But Peter began to explain to them in full detail. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in the trance, I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord. For nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice of the Lord answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times. Peter was a stubborn rascal. In John 21, Jesus had to tell him three times, right? Anybody identify with being stubborn? You just want to do it your own way? Man, isn't it good to know that a rascal like Peter can love Jesus and go to heaven? It gives me great hope today. I'm a rascal. God loves me. Uh, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to spend eternity at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him, not because of my successes, but because my failures were washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is awesome. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth, but the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, Three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we went, entered the man's house, and he told us how he had seen the angel stand his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and your whole household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, when we heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Church, listen to this. Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Because they got out of the way, 
People got saved. People repented of sins, and the church continued to grow. Every time they infused themselves into the equation, the church started to die. But every time they got out of the way and they allowed the Holy Spirit to do the work, then God did great things. So let's find out how we can have uncommon faith today. May I pray over this word? Father, my prayer is that your Holy Spirit will speak to even the hardest of hearts here today. My prayer, Father God, is that your Spirit would bring this word to life in this beautiful congregation, in this beautiful community. No matter where we are in our spiritual journey, we could be on milk or we could be chewing solid food. I pray that we would all be chewing solid food today, Father. Bless us, Father. Anoint us with your power. Help us to have great understanding. Help us to receive it and make a choice at the end to live it out in our life so other people can see what it looks like when a Christian lives in this world, Lord. Bless us. Bless this word. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. All God's people say, please take notes today. Uh, It's hard for me not to get passionate and jump around and get excited. I am down with a knee injury, so maybe the Lord wants me to calm down a little bit. Uh, So let me just give you these points and share with you what the Lord told me as I've been praying all week at this altar. The first point that I see in this passage that Peter is learning and that these other gentlemen with the circumcised group are about to learn is something that I think we need to grow from today as well. To live an uncommon faith, we need to understand that we never need to allow the world's opinion to dictate heaven's mission. If you're going to have an uncommon faith, you need to make a stand today that you're not going to listen to the opinion of the world. You need to make a stand today that you're going to hear from the Lord. You're going to listen to the Holy Spirit. You're going to walk when he says walk. You're going to jump when he says jump. You're going to speak when he says speak. You're going to go where he says to go. You don't need to pray for an open door. I tell people all the time, most of the time, you have to walk to the closed door, believing in faith, he's going to open it before you get there. To follow God means that you have to truly believe that his voice, his power, and his plan for your life is greater than anything you can find in the world. And a lot of Christians still struggle because they try to keep one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. And there's this thing that rages called spiritual warfare that is on a level much greater than it should be because when we put both feet in God's kingdom, there's a lot more joy being there than putting one foot in the world and one foot with God. And Peter struggled with this, folks. Let me tell you, there's a situation that even happened after Peter had this very successful moment for the kingdom. Peter is on all cylinders right here. He is defending the gospel of Jesus Christ. He doesn't care what anybody thinks. The circumcised group came to him. He is not puffing up saying, well, you should have seen what I did. He's not living in fear and running away and digging a hole and putting his head in the sand. He's not making excuses like a spiritual porky pig, right? Da-deba-deba. He is actually speaking words of confirmation that God did something amazing. But this wasn't always Peter's standard. I don't know if you know anything about Paul's confrontation with him in the book of Galatians, but Paul noticed that Peter was being a hypocrite in his faith. He was being a hypocrite after this moment where he was hitting on all cylinders for the kingdom. So Peter had this thing that he struggled with. Paul noticed Peter when the Jewish circumcised group came in town to eat. He noticed Peter leaving the Gentiles immediately, going to sit down and observing the dietary laws of the Jewish people. And then when the Jewish people were gone, he'd come and he'd enjoy a good old barbecue with some sauce on it with the Gentiles. And Paul said, wait, time out. You are being, here's what I love about Paul. He didn't talk about him behind his back. He went nose to nose with this dude. How many of you believe you should say something face to face with someone, right? I love it that Paul addresses in scripture. I went to his face and I looked him in the eye and I told him he was being a hypocrite. And Peter responded productively. Let me tell you why Paul did that. Let's read it in the book of Galatians, starting with chapter 11, to chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like the Jews? Go to the next scripture. For for am I seeking 
the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So here's what Paul is trying to tell Peter. That because of your hypocrisy, because you're listening to the world and you're diving into the world's opinion, you are not only ruining the Galatian church that was planted, that was built, that was growing because of the power of the Holy Spirit. You are even affecting Barnabas who was an awesome follower of Jesus Christ. He is starting to become a hypocrite just like you. So here's the point that I want to make with this. When we decide to listen to the world's opinion and we walk away from God's authoritative plan for our life, not only do we suffer in our faith, but we cause other people to suffer as well. The church cannot grow unless we grow individually. Our homes cannot be saved unless we are saved individually. I love it that Peter preaches the gospel to Cornelius, and the next thing we see in Scripture is his entire house is saved because the Holy Spirit will always, always get other people caught up in a revival. But the negative effect of that is if we walk away from God, that has a heavy impact on the world as well. And this is something that I used to, I struggled uh, with this just the other day. My wife and I received... Uh, really nice tickets to go to the Wells Fargo uh, golf tournament. Uh, we had never been given such beautiful tickets. These were clubhouse tickets. I think they were like $1,000 each, and someone gave them uh, to me and my wife just to go hang out with all the elite folk on the golf course. I love playing golf, but I have never in my life been given such a great gift. I normally get free tickets from Pastor Kelvin when he can't go, and he wants me to go walk around and follow people in the heat when they're practicing. Like, I've never seen people actually play with a score, right? And so my wife and I go, and I decide to buy these nice shorts and my Puma shirt and my Puma shoes. And man, I thought I was looking great. In fact, uh, these are the shorts that I had on. Woo! Come on, baby. And well, some of you are really mean. Thank you for helping me relive the moment. So I had on my belt, I had on my Puma shirt, I had these shorts on. And when I'm walking into the parking lot, the policeman, the average ordinary Joes are looking at me going, that's what I'm talking about. And I get to the front where all the volunteers are, right? The average ordinary people. And I got all these people looking at me going, oh, I love those shorts. You know, I told my wife, I said, this is going to be a good day. I said, everybody likes my shorts. My wife says, you look good. So I keep walking. Everybody's complimenting me. Then I get to where all the preps are. All the rich folk in the clubhouse. And I notice that people are pointing and making fun of my shorts. And I start to get frustrated. I see six guys standing around drinking a Budweiser, and they're going, <laughs> and I'm like, Amy, I feel t terrible. Like, this is very frustrating. I'm embarrassed. My wife said, why do you care what anybody thinks? I'm like, I never have before, but I do today. This is embarrassing. I don't want to even be here. My wife said, are you kidding me? So we kept walking. I went to the bathroom, and a guy walking out of the bathroom as I'm standing in line, he walked by, and he went, <laughs> and I literally wanted to go, ha, 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 ha. I mean, I was frustrated. I told my wife, if anybody else says anything to me, I'm at least going to hold them accountable. They're being rude. So the next group that was looking at me, I noticed they were looking at me, and I had my wife beside me. I turned around. I said, do you like my shorts, or are you just staring? And they said, no, we like them. I said, well, good, because I'm taking names from here on out the rest of the day, because everybody's being rude to me. And they went, oh, my gosh. And those were people that actually liked my shorts. So I was having a really bad moment, a really bad day. I was caring about what other people thought about me, and it made me feel terrible. It made me not even want to enjoy the festivities of the day. And here's what God spoke to me about. Christian, the, the people that are making fun of you, they go throughout the entire day without anybody making fun of them, but they also go throughout the entire day without anybody saying, hey, I like your shorts. And God told me, you can either live this kind of a life where you fly under the radar and nobody notices you, or you can deal with the persecution and you can get some good compliments. Which one do you want to be? And then I'm a preacher, so it instantly hit me with my faith. That I can go through life as a Christian and I can fly under the radar and I can listen to the world's opinion and I can never be persecuted, I can never be noticed, I can never go through trials or struggles, or I can stand up boldly for the name of Jesus Christ. I can be persecuted, people can point, they can talk bad about me, but people are receiving Jesus on an eternal level. And that's the choice I have to make as a pastor. And that's the choice you have to make as a Christian. 
Because the enemy would love for you to care more about what the world thinks. Because when you care more about what the world thinks, nobody's life is being changed because of you. But when we get persecuted, when people point, when they make fun, when we continue to share the gospel boldly, then I believe pockets of revival start with our life. In fact, when we look at Peter here, hitting on all cylinders, the church experienced growth. But in the book of Galatians, Paul pointed out, because you're caring about the world, the church is dying. So we have two choices. We can live an uncommon faith where we never allow the world's opinion to dictate heaven's missional plan for our life. Or we can live a common faith, I believe still go to heaven, but never make a difference on the earth that we live in. Which one do you think God wants us to do? How many of you think the Lord wants you to make a difference now? Paul says to live as Christ. He had life every single day. He knew to die was gain, but he knew that he could live for Christ here as well. And if you're going to have an uncommon faith, that's what it's going to require. Here's what I would encourage you with. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 23 says this. If we have that verse, we can put that up. Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to the Jews and it's folly to the Gentiles. So here's the point Paul's trying to make. To the religious people, it's a stumbling block. To the people that don't believe, it's foolishness. You can't please anybody except for God, and he's the only one you need to care about anyway. Amen? So don't worry about what the world thinks. Live your life for Christ. Listen to the voice of God. Never allow the world's opinion to take you in a direction that God doesn't want you to go in. He's got a missional plan for your life, but you can't get there listening to the world. Amen? The second thing that I see in Scripture is this. Uncommon faith we never, never allows the world's opinion to dictate heaven's mission, but I also believe that uncommon faith helps us to penetrate the world's pollution with a God solution. Helps us to penetrate the world's pollution with a God solution. And in verse 4, it says, Peter began to explain to them in order. So what did he explain to them? His personal journey, or did he talk about Jesus? Did he take glory for himself or did he give glory to God? Did he talk about his accomplishments or did he talk about the accomplishments of the Holy Spirit? Peter made it very clear. He got out of the way in that moment and he said, I know that there's pollution in the world and the only way this pollution can be cleaned up is if I apply a God solution. So in his testimony to the uncircumcised group, he made it very clear. We're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about God's authoritative plan for my life and for your life as well. We're going to talk about the Gentile church being born. I saw a vision. Cornelius saw angels. We heard a word from the Lord. The Holy Spirit came. People spoke in angelic tongues. People were transformed and changed. He didn't take any credit. He gave all the credit to the kingdom of God. He knew the only way to impact the world's pollution was to offer a God solution. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And too many times I feel like we try to fix a worldly problem with a worldly solution. Amen? And we don't depend on God to do a great work in us and through us. Two things that I want to encourage you with today. Write these down. If you would like to penetrate the world's pollution with a God solution, the first one is this. We need to learn to get involved. We have to learn to get involved. Romans 10, 14 says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching to them? How can anybody hear the good news of Jesus Christ unless we get involved and share it with them? Jesus makes it very clear in the Gospel of Luke. If you got two coats, what good is it going to do somebody that has no coat if you don't give them one? James makes it clear in chapter 2. If you got clothing and if you got food and somebody is naked and they're hungry, but you don't give them clothing and you don't give them food, how is it that you say you can be a Christian and not offer them the good things of God? James is saying the same things that Jesus said. You need to get involved with what God has given you. He's giving you great resources. I don't know if you've heard about the church growing in Pakistan or the church that's growing in Turkey and the church, the underground church, which is the largest underground church in the world in China. They have hardly any resources. You know what they got? They got Jesus. They got the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and the church is growing. We have Jesus. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, and God has given us a ton of resources. I believe, actually, the greatest church that should be growing should be right here in America. But we are trying to fix the world's pollution with our own answers instead of God's solution. Did pollution have a, an effect on Peter in his day? There was a man named Nero that was burning Christians at the stake. How many of you would say that's worldly pollution? Anybody here? There was poverty on a level greater than what we have today. There was no governmental help because the government in charge was Rome. You think they're helping Christian children that are starving to death? No. They're putting them on a stake and setting their bodies on fire. There was no help for famine. Uh, there was no help for hunger. Uh, there was no help for poverty. In fact, the Romans would hire tax collectors like Matthew to go rob even the poor. And they would give Roman soldiers spears to persecute them with death if they didn't give them everything they had. There was pollution in Peter's day. And I'm trying to encourage you. Because sometimes as a church, we feel like, listen, nobody knows what I'm going through. The church grew and they went through sometimes worse than what we went through today. But yet they were fixing the world's pollution with a God solution. I heard an amazing story. I think Pastor Tom talked about it uh, with a young man that they sh showed the video here, I think, as well, that grew up in the home of a KKK member. His father was a KKK member. And they talked about how this young man gave his life to Christ and God just took all that racism and hatred out of his heart. Kelvin told me something the other day that I thought was really cool. He said, an African-American man called him and said, that blew me away. Whatever that was, that blew me away. I have never seen such healing in my life. I've never seen a man who grew up in a family that belonged to the KKK that loved all people in the name of Jesus. He said, that impacted me so much. And all those things were awesome that Kelvin was telling me, but the most powerful thing that Kelvin said, this man said, was Kelvin... I want to get involved. I want to be a part of the solution, not the problem. And I said, that is good. All that other stuff he said was good, but that is great. Because he realized, I just can't sit back and expect the pollution to go away by itself. I have to get involved. I have to serve. I have to give. I have to love. I have to embrace. I have to accept. I have to change myself. And Kelvin said it was amazing because like the next Sunday, there was a picture of this man that was embracing this former KKK member from a family. They were embracing each other at the altar and hugging each other. That is a solution to the world's pollution right there. That's God. Only God can do that. And I'm praying for my uncle because I had three biracial children. My uncle told me 17 years ago, if you bring any of those kids to my house... I'm going to kill them. Lives in York, South Carolina at the end of an old dirt road, dying and living life all by himself. Isn't that sad? And I'm praying that God would heal him. The only thing that's going to change my uncle's heart is a God solution. He will never find that kind of healing and change in the world. I can sit down with him and have a conversation with him all day. My kids are awesome. They are beautiful. They're way more good looking with you with your red hair and your freckles, man. You should see my kids. They're awesome. They got black curly hair, dark eyes, six foot four. Come on. I could say it all day long and nothing would change him but Jesus. Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you ready to get involved? That's the only way this church and this community is going to change. The second thing that I understand when it comes to penetrating the world's pollution is this. We need to start our day with Jesus. Psalms 5.3, King David says, O oh Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you, and I watch and I wait. King David didn't say at the end of the day, Lord, thank you for this day. I hate I missed all those opportunities I could have had all day long. He said, in the morning, Father, this morning belongs to you. I'm starting my day with you. Father, do a great work all day long. Which is exactly why he said in Psalms 118, This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. That is a present tense prayer. That is not a prayer that we pray after the day is gone. That's something that King David woke up with. This is the day the Lord hath made. He started his day with the Lord. The Lord's Prayer, my Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me what? Give me this day my daily bread. Forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who have trespassed against me. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All prayers have power, but if you pray that prayer at 12 o'clock at night, you've missed a great opportunity. Because that prayer is all about the morning time. That prayer is all about the morning. Give me this day my daily bread. Jesus told them that they should start their day that way. They should captivate and take every opportunity to start their day and be prepared for kingdom work. I think a lot of times we only go to God when we're desperate. We only go to God when we get bad news. And instead of me giving you a story, here's the challenge that I want to give Radiant Church today. I want you to start your day every single day this week. And I want you to come back to me next week and go, Christian, you're a liar. And then I'm going to say, we'll take that up with God because this is what the Lord says. But I want you, every day, block out time first thing in the morning. Get in the Word of God. Pray to the Lord. Rejoice in the goodness of God. Listen to worship music on the way to work. Block out time. Give and dedicate that time to the Lord. And then you come to me next week, and you tell me all the good things that God did in your day all day long. Because every day I start off with the Lord, and anybody want to testify with me? Things go much better than when I start off on my own power. Start your day for the kingdom. The third thing is this as we continue to go. Uncommon faith never allows the world's opinion to dictate heaven's mission. Uncommon faith penetrates the world's pollution with God's solution, which is exactly what Peter did. And uncommon faith truly surrenders because it understands that true surrender will always lead to greater kingdom victories. True surrender. Not partial surrender, right? My wife and I had these conversations when we were young. I never grabbed my wife's heart by coming up to her and going, you know what, I think I'm going to give you a portion of my heart forever. I hope that's okay with you. Because I'd still be alone if that would have been what I would have said. But I've been with my wife for 30 years because I told her in the very beginning, you can have all of me. You can have my whole heart. And I can remember standing at the altar with my wife and me just weeping and my wife holding my hands. And she knew why I was crying. Because I didn't live a very godly life before I met her. I told people, and I've told people in here, I felt like I was getting a Mercedes Benz and she was getting a beat up Kia at best. And if you drive a Kia, I'm sorry. Okay, I apologize before I get the emails. Kias are awesome. I'll take a Kia all day long right now. And my wife looked at me and she looked at my eyes. She said, I love you and I forgive you and God forgives you. She, she watched me grow in my faith. She has cried with me many tears. She has encouraged me through many dark nights. And the reason my wife is with me and the reason she loves me and the reason she encourages me is because a long time ago, I said, I fully surrender my heart and my love to you and I fully surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Wherever he would take me, whatever he would ask me to do, I will do. And I'm telling you, when you get there, God can do great things in your life. And I love the change that took place. Verse 2, we see these nasty religious circumcised guys Condemning and criticizing Peter. Peter went up to Jerusalem and the circumcision party criticized him. You were with the uncircumcised people. But in verse 18, it says when they heard these things from Peter, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. What was the change? They criticized Peter and then they praised God and thanked Peter for being a man of God. What was the change? It was this Greek word that we find in this passage. And this is the Greek word. Hezukzo. Hezukzo. It's a Greek word that means to refrain from labor. It means to not meddle in somebody else's business. And it means to not even speak. So when in the ESV, they said they fell silent, the King James says they finally perceived. The Greek word says hekazuso. It's a word that means they finally realized they couldn't add anything to God's work. 
They couldn't work enough to produce what God could produce. They were going to stop meddling in God's business, and they were going to fully get committed to Him and His way. That is the transformation that took place. Can anybody confess today that they probably need to go through that transformation as well? We need to quit laboring because we got nothing to offer that's anything better than what God can offer. We need to quit speaking because we need to only speak when God opens our mouth with the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to quit meddling in God's business. And I'm one of the ones that always feels like he can do it better than somebody else. And I'm always meddling in things. And I'm always trying to fix stuff. And I'm always feeling like my way is better. And God has been taking me through a breaking process where I'm going to stop meddling. Because every time I meddle, every time I speak out of turn, I start to labor in the flesh. And I don't know about you, but it can be tiresome to fail all the time. Anybody else? understand what I'm talking about? Like when you labor in the flesh doing your own thing, you get tired. You get tired and you get tired of it. And God says, look, just get out of the way. You got nothing to offer. Just follow me. And that's what these men learned. They said, who are we to stand in God's way? They perceived, they understood, they fell silent. They stopped laboring in the flesh And they stopped meddling in God's business. And then the church grew. Charles Templeton and Billy Graham were really close evangelists together. They were best friends. I don't know if you've ever heard the story. In the 1940s, Billy Graham had a partner. His name was Charles Templeton. And they were going to take over the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Charles Templeton started to read the Word of God and study the Word of God, and he started to listen to the opinions of others. The scientific evolutionist community was starting to come up with some of their scientific facts that have changed over the last uh, 100 years, probably 100 times in the things that they're saying. And Charles Templeton went to Billy Graham and said, Billy, I just don't think the world could have been created in six days. And Billy said, oh, oh my, Charles, it, it, it did happen that way because that's what God's Word says. And Charles said, well, no, it says here, and, and it says over here. This kind of contradicts. And Billy, I got, I got issues right here. And Billy, I just don't understand this right here. And over here in the Gospel of Luke, I, I just don't really feel like this is, was interpreted right. And, you know, at the Council of Trent, I think they might have missed this interpretation. And I know the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, but my goodness, this couldn't have been what Paul was talking about in Corinthians. And Revelations, are you kidding me? Was John high? Are you, what, what was going on there? I don't believe this anymore. Anymore. And Billy said, look, for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord. You have to go your own path. And Charles Templeton became an atheist and an evolutionist. And he walked away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he died at 82 years old right after he wrote his last book called Farewell to God. Isn't that sad? Now, Honestly, I I wouldn't write about something I didn't believe in or desire. So I don't even know why he wrote a book about God unless he still had a big hole in his heart and he knew he needed God. But he died, according to all accounts, without Jesus living in his life. What changed for Billy? Why did Billy change the entire world as we know it with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because at that same time, he went out to an old tree stump And he laid his Bible down when his old friend left him and went to the world. He said, God, I don't understand a lot of this, but I surrender to it. I believe it, I embrace it, and I will live it out my entire life. Though I don't understand, I will preach it, and I will believe it with my whole heart. How many of you believe that God did something with that? In fact... Near the end of Charles Templeton's life, the only thing he ever said good about any Christian in the world was about Billy Graham. He said, he's the only true evangelist that I would ever trust in this lifetime. God can do great things with someone who is fully surrendered to him. So what about you today? Because we have to make a choice like that young lady in the bumper video. We have to make a choice whether or not we want to live a common life or whether or not we want to leave the house and live an uncommon faith. I love it in Scripture that the Lord tells Peter that nothing that I have made clean is unclean or common, Peter. And I want to encourage, as I call my good brother, 
Fitzgerald McGill to come up here and do a song for us this morning. Fitz is one of my closest friends that I love with all my heart, and I ask him to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit and to sing to us this morning just him and a guitar. And I want to come down here to the altar with you this morning. And I want to confess to you that there's a lot of times that I have allowed the world's opinion to dictate my faith, and I want to ask for your forgiveness, and I want to come down this morning, and I want to pray with my family here. There's a lot of times that I have tried to penetrate the world's pollution without a God solution, and there is a lot of times that I have tried to live my faith without true surrender to the Lord. Anybody else in here with me on that? Like, I have just fought God. I am not going there. I am not going to say that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. This feels better. It looks right. It sounds right. People have even told me they heard from God, so it must be right. And I have went right off the cliff every single time. So here's what I want us to do today. If you would like to make a confession today and say, I, I want to live an uncommon faith. I am tired of living a common faith. I'm going to surrender to God an uncommon existence today. I'm going to penetrate the world's pollution with a God solution from this moment on. I'm no longer going to worry about what the world thinks, but I'm only going to chase after hard God's heavenly missional plan for my life. And today, Lord, I want to change. I want to surrender my entire heart to you because I realize today, if you cleanse me, I will not be unclean. I will not be common. But if you cleanse me today at this altar, Father God, that I will be made holy in your sight. If that's anybody here as he sings this song, let's pray together this morning. Sometimes it just takes one, but we're going to open it up to all people. Whoever would want to come down today and make that confession and ask God to help them live an uncommon faith, come on down and let's pray together.